Hey everyone, Ryan from eBike Escape. We're back with Matt at All About Bikes. It's been a little bit while since we've done a bike build. And in this video, we're gonna be unboxing the brand new Ride One Up Cafe Cruiser. So let's get into it. Before we get started with the unboxing, if you are looking to purchase any Ride One Up electric bike, please consider using the link in the description before you make your purchase. It's a free and easy way to help support the channel. Really appreciate that. I also have our other resources as well, electric bike accessories list, top e-bike brands page, and finally our electric bike discounts code page where I track all the deals on the electric bike brands that I follow. With that, let's unbox the Ride One Up Cafe Cruiser. Tape everywhere. So Ride One Up has a new box design. I believe on their, almost all of their other models, they used to have a TV so people wouldn't throw the box around, the FedEx or UPS people. Now they have this fun cityscape. It says ride more, drive less, which is definitely uh, a mission behind the company, creating uh, city commuter style e-bikes, trying to get people um, outside of uh, driving their vehicles, probably a good time to do that with uh, gas prices. <laughs> That's cool. I didn't realize they used to have a TV on their boxes. Yeah. All right, this is where you need to get a friend to help you out yeah. to, to get these out for sure. Still not easy with a team. Dang, look at these tires, huh? Yeah. 26 by 3 -0. Chow Yang. Nice little city tread pattern there, but definitely gonna add some comfort. Big tires on e-bikes make sense to me. You're not really getting the penalty of having to haul it around as much because you get the electric assist or throttle in these most cases, so I like having a comfy ride. So while Matt's kind of going and cutting all these zip ties, I thought I would talk a little bit about this bike. It actually was a, a surprise when Ride One Up announced this electric bike because it seemed like it was a very short period of time between when they started talking about it, teased some photos, and then finally it was launched and then shipping in February 2022. And as I mentioned earlier, they focus on city style e-bikes and this might be my favorite frame design of all of them because of course it has cargo capabilities on the rear here. We got a built-in rear rack. And this Cafe Cruiser is priced at a great price in my opinion. Obviously we'll do a full review on this electric bike, but the current price is $15.95 and we'll talk about some of the components. Look at that nice wide seat on the Cafe Cruiser definitely set up for comfort. And I should also add, this is not the first electric bike from Ride One Up that Matt has assembled. We also did the 700 series, if you remember that one, the step through gray model, um, which I think you are a, a fan of. You got to ride that yeah, around yeah, a little bit. That was one of my favorites that we've done so far. And it is offered in two different frame designs here. They call it a step through, I believe, but it's really a mid step, but definitely going to be easier for you to throw your leg over. You'll be able to see that a little bit closer. Just want to note that uh, you want to take the seat post out um, so you can get some grease in the seat tube here. That's pretty normal on most bike builds, but uh, that's something that is noteworthy for new folks putting these together. So get a little grease in there, back in, and we're going to adjust this a little bit tighter. I'm going to be putting it up in my e-bikes or in my bike stand. And we've talked about uh, that grease before, but that is a product from Finish Line. It's the white grease. I'll put a link in the description. It's actually something that I, a lot of people have been asking about uh, what Matt uses. Yeah, it's good to have the gun. I really like it um, at premium grease. And uh, I guess I've had this little grease gun now for probably three years now, and it's still holding up. All right, up we go. I think the weight on this bike was 65 pounds, if I'm not mistaken. It feels about it. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. So this is a pretty quick release for them, huh? Yeah, I think so. And one other thing I wanted to call out uh, with this bike. So when we assembled the 700 series and I've assembled the previous Ride One Up electric bikes, 
Uh, the company previously has not had their front forks installed. Now they did make the decision on this bike to have the fork installed. So that's going to make it a little bit more consumer friendly if you do decide to do an assembly uh, at home. Of course, if you don't have the confidence, a bike shop is always a good option because they'll be able to adjust your brakes perfectly, adjust the rear derailleur. We're gonna take a look at all of those different things in this video uh, to hopefully help you out if you do decide to assemble it. Uh, obviously, I'm a pretty big fan of the local bike shop scene uh, here. But, you know, I certainly don't mind giving some pointers and some tips on how you can do this at home safely and, and comfortably. Even if you're not buying from Ride One Up, uh, one thing to note is, I mean, these basic maintenance and adjusting the brakes apply to really any bike uh, that you are going to purchase. Yeah, that's pretty true, isn't it? Most e-bikes are gonna be pretty similar for assembly really like this blue i think it looks definitely nicer in person uh it's always hard to tell from the website mock-ups but i think this is a really cool color choice it's offered in a few different options i believe more of a gray and then also this light tan glossy color that actually maybe like a sand color that i think also looks really sharp and i just have to say i've been following ride one up for now well over a year um, probably closer to two years. And I have to say, I've been really impressed with the changes they've made to their bikes, trying to consistently uh, make improvements. And I feel like this bike looks pretty refined. It doesn't really look like a first generation, uh, in my opinion. Well, that's the thing too. The company has grown and, uh, you know, they get to dial it in a little bit better each time. So when they're releasing a, a new model, it's not as going to be as clumsy as, as the first generation models that they did. And, you know, when you are buying a bike, I always say, you know, like the bigger brands have a lot of funding behind them. And so you're also purchasing a fair amount of engineering and research and development. So um, something to keep in mind when you're looking at one of the bigger e-bike companies like Ride One Up. Got some giant swept back handlebars. This is called the Cafe Cruiser after all. Yeah, that's fun. A little flair to it. Absolutely. And those handlebars, uh, in my experience, have been really fun. Uh, that style of handlebar. So. And I talked about the rear rack, but we will be testing out a child seat as well as the passenger package that they're offering with this bike, which I think is really cool. Definitely sets this model apart from the other models when you look at the weight capacity of this rear rack and being able to haul children and maybe even some uh, smaller children, small adults uh, on the rear of there. Wouldn't mind giving a shout out to my favorite Allen wrench uh, set here too. Um, although we're not sponsored by them just yet, I will say that uh, this Wera brand um, is just a really nice, uh, Allen key set that's all color coded. This particular one is stainless. Really makes the job nice when you know, you know, the difference between a four and a five mil and they're color coded. But this is something I wouldn't mind uh, seeing if we could do some reviews on too. Let's yeah. get some tools for Absolutely. me to. <laughs> if you're in the industry, yeah, feel free to email me, Ryan at eBike Escape. Little uh, detour from. Uh, Getting some uh, wheels, maybe you want to, I think it's really cool that you play uh, bike polo. I don't know if you want to yeah. share with the audience a little bit about your travels in Puerto Rico. Yeah, so I was just out in uh, Puerto Rico a couple weeks ago for a bike polo tournament. A lot of people don't know what it is, but it's kind of like hockey on bikes. Um, really fun sport. We play it on a hard court surface. It originated in Seattle probably 22, 23 years ago. And uh, it's just a really, really entertaining sport to watch. And I've been hooked on it now for probably 12 years and travel all over the country and, and would like to go to Worlds next year as well. So um, check it out uh, on YouTube. You can check out some of the better footage. It's going to be 2017 World Hardcore Bike Polo from Lexington. It's got some pretty good footage of what that, what that sport is. So, yeah. Thanks for uh, letting me spotlight that for a moment. It's great. And Matt's being modest. Uh, he took first most recently at the uh, tournament in uh, Puerto Rico. And actually, was that the 
second, third tournament in a row you've taken first place? Yeah, second in a row as far as that goes. And it's been a heck of a year for me. Uh, yeah, I've been, been fortunate to hook up with some really good teammates. Uh, a lot of fun to, to go to a place like Puerto Rico, uh, one of the more competitive tournaments of the year. And I was about ready to cry on Saturday from how how stiff the competition was. And uh, lo and behold, we pulled it off uh, on Sunday in a single elimination. We, we didn't lose, so kind of fun. I take that back. It's extremely fun. <laughs> the most fun I've ever had. So you took the stem plate off, very, pretty easy. And, uh, oh, not if I do that. <laughs> And uh, just lining up those handlebars, they're uh, ribbed, I guess, maybe, to help you center um, the handlebars in there. So again, really like that they um, have the fork installed. That was one of the reasons that I really wanted to bring Matt the 700 series, because while I can do it, I just want to make sure it's done properly. So love that this is all pretty much ready to go. Throw on the handlebars, very similar to... Uh, a lot of electric bike builds at this point, throw on the handlebars, throw on the pedals, and then just dial everything in. Yeah, and when you are putting stem plates on like this, the front piece, you do want to keep an eye out between the top and the bottom and make sure you've got, you know, pretty even spacing between the two. So I'll probably loosen up these top ones just a little bit and then snug it in on the bottom. A lot of people just go ahead and crank them down the whole way, and you're not going to get an even tension on it for one thing. And you could even end up bottoming out the one side while the other side is, um, you know, pretty big gap. So got that snug for now, and we'll just go ahead and torque that. And when I'm putting these on, I'm kind of checking the lines in here to make sure it's centered. Um, and it looks like it's pretty good. Same spacing on either side. And then when we torque it, we're just going to go opposite corners. This is going to be torquing it to 5.1 newton meters on this particular torque wrench. And we're good to go on that. Well, this bike does have hydraulic brakes, zoom hydraulic brakes. You know, these brakes come on a lot of electric bikes. Uh, and I feel like they're a more affordable option for these companies uh, to use. They don't feel, you know, perhaps as high end as some like Shimano hydraulic brakes, but in my experience, they get the job done. I'll be curious what uh, what you think, uh, Matt, on those when you get a feel for them. They haven't been bad on some of the other ones that we've done as far as that goes. Um, they seem very similar to, to like the Tektro brand as far as that goes. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and just check this wheel for, for true as long as it's... Add a little bit at a. Let's see here. And not the biggest deal that uh, to check the. I mean, it's always good to at least see how they look out of the box and make sure that there's no, no huge wobble. But, um, you know, with a disc brake wheel like this, you're not going to have a whole lot of problems this is just mainly to mainly for my my sanity to make sure that everything's within tolerances and it's got a little gap here and there but nothing that I would say is is detrimental to the wheel health as far as that goes so but always a good idea and something that we do um, in the bike industry for new builds. Just make sure that it didn't get damaged in shipping and that everything's all right. And one thing I'll just call out from my experience, uh, having ridden cargo electric bikes, if you do plan to put a lot of weight back here, perhaps a small adult or something, and you ever hear clicking from the back of your uh, bike, it might be that you need to tighten the spokes. Uh, that's something that I've had to experience on our uh, Rad Power Bikes, Rad Wagon, loading it up with lots of weight. It's just you're gonna hear more of the, um, the spokes kind of creaking if they're not adjusted properly, especially with uh, more weight on the back. Sure. Yeah, that's a good thing to check too out of the box is make sure that the spokes all feel, you know, tight. You can kind of, I mean, you just don't want anything to feel, you know, sloppy on here. So just 
going around. They might might feel a little bit tighter, you know, on some rather than others. But uh, you know, certainly if there's any looseness, it, like where they're kind of noodly, then you'd probably want to take it in right away to a shop um, and have them take a look at it. Uh, so just nice even spoke tension. This feels all right from everywhere I grabbed. Um, but back to the front wheel, I was putting the quick release in and I just noticed something that I don't think we've done before on the videos is just to show how the, this actually had the, the, the quick release springs doubled up on each other. So you'd actually want to take that, that outside one off and, um, we're going to go ahead and these, the little part of the spring actually goes up against the quick release. Uh, I had it backwards way, way back when, when I started in the industry about 16 years ago, I put them on backwards. And so what that does is it, it, it actually creates a problem with your uh, axle interface. So you do really want to make sure that the little part is going up against uh, your little quick release axle there. And then you're just going to thread this on part of the way. And Matt always puts the lever on the non-disc side, which I think is a great tip. Just keeps your hands away from the rotor um, when putting the uh, the wheel on. Yeah, I think that's really noteworthy because, you know, when you're applying a lot of pressure on something and you're going towards a sharp surface, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Now, aesthetically speaking, it, they've always gone on the non-drive side for aesthetics or pitchers or things like that. But you know what? I like, I like my hands uh, fine with no blood on them. <laughs> we'll keep them away from the sharp surfaces. So make sure you remove that. Uh... Yep. I actually just went ahead and did that by default. But here, this little disc brake spacer was in here kind of clicked in, but in order to get the front wheel in, you do got to just pull that out. That's something that you might want to keep too. If you ever transport your bike and take the front wheel off and you just have something to put back in your, uh, your brake caliper. It's just like with, uh, hydraulics on cars. You do not want to squeeze the lever, uh, when the, uh, when there's nothing in there, you're, you can close your caliper after a few good squeezes. Then you got to take it into a professional and have it bled. <laughs> and that's going to be the left brake, uh, just to be aware. So be extra careful with the left brake um, when you have that out of the bike. Go ahead and stick that up and in. I kind of give it my knee to center it. Another way to do it, uh, you know, if you're not doing the stand, and actually a really good way anyways is to stand over the bike um, when you, once you get the front wheel in and then you can put your weight on the front end and then close your quick release. Cause then gravity is helping you. And I'm just going to get this nice and snug. And you do want to also pay attention, see how your wheel is centered in your dropouts here. You can put it off one side or the other. And so when you're adjusting your disc brake, you can have quite a bit of difficulties. If you're not, you can actually go ahead and just as an example here, we could go ahead and shift it down in the dropout like that. So you can see that like it's definitely to the left side pretty easily now. So just be aware of that a lot of people are not aware that you can, you know, make it off center in your, in your dropout quite a bit if you're not careful. As far as tightening that lever, I've always heard when you push that in, should make an imprint on your hand. I think that's probably pretty good. Yeah, exactly. And you know, if it's super hard to where you're having a hard time getting op getting it open or you got to use a tool to actually as leverage to get it off, that's where you're going too tight and you can actually ruin the cams, you know, or, or your quick release that way. So it's just a fine balance. You, you really, really don't want to do it too soft, but too hard. And yeah, you won't enjoy that either. Front light looks like is going to be the next thing I think we're going to put on. All right. So looks like we have, if I'm not mistaken, a five mil right here. Unscrew this. I believe this is the same light that comes on the 700 series. Pretty bright in my opinion. Obviously give that a test in our full review and I'll talk more about it, but I kind of like when they, especially being a brand that focuses on kind of commuting, uh, putting a front, nice front light bright on there is, uh, is always nice. Yeah. 
That's one less thing you have to have to get when you go out for a ride when it's all integrated in. I really like that about taking e-bikes out is, you know, when I'm riding my normal bike, I got to make sure my lights are on there and I got everything in order. And so taking an e-bike out, it's just like, boom, hop on, everything's set, lights are good to go, they're plugged in, don't have to worry about charging them. I guess you got to worry about charging your, your battery, but... And just speaking of the battery, since we're right here, enters the bottom of the down tube here. 15 amp hour battery, slightly above average. I view average battery size at 14 amp hours. Uh, and obviously this looks super clean and uh, really like, it's a, sometimes a little bit tricky for people to get used to these batteries that come underneath, but a few times I personally haven't had any issues. Just want to make sure obviously it's nice and, and locked in there. We got a metal fender, front and rear. Yeah, I've got mixed feelings on metal fenders. They, uh, they're really nice because they're durable and I feel like they don't, they don't actually dent that easily. But then, you know, they, they do make a little bit noise, a little bit more noise when you get gravel, you know, coming up through them. But I think they, they have a sharp look. They look a little bit nicer than the plastic ones. And I would agree. And sometimes with the metal fenders, especially on the rear of the bike, uh, sometimes you get some vibrations and then they kind of reverberate, I guess, uh, with that uh, fender. This one is feels really snug in there, so I don't anticipate we'll hear anything. But it is something that uh, that can happen with the metal fenders compared to the plastic ones. But I think these look certainly really sharp on this bike. Just gives the bike a little bit of a higher quality feel. It does, doesn't it? I agree with that. I guess functionality, there isn't a whole lot of difference between the plastic or the metal. It just, it does look sharper, a little bit, a little bit nicer. I thought we had to have a nut the last time we did these, but maybe I'm wrong. It looks like, yeah, there is little threads right in there. I thought they had a nut before, but this is actually going to be a little bit nicer, I would say. You are just going to want to make sure that you hold your, your fender mount, you know, snug to where it's not going to be an issue. Um, you're not battling spring tension on it or anything because that's when you start getting into cross-threading issues. It's when you're battling it from the beginning. So just got that started somewhat snug and once I get this one in then I'll go ahead and finish snugging it up. Let's just drop it one more time. I think I do that in every assembly video. So why change it up now, right? I do choose to use uh, the mechanics gloves, which make it a little bit sloppier, but I got some soft hands underneath these black gloves. <laughs> Check these out and kind of snug these down where they move a little bit harder. That way when you start hitting bumps, they're not coming completely loose on you. And also up front, we have the Ride One Up badge. They've been including that on a lot of their bikes now. It says Class 3, established 2018. Again, just a, a little touch, but I just feel like it just makes the bike look more expensive than it actually it is. Of course, Ride One Up is a brand that focuses on value-priced electric bikes direct to consumer. And uh, the reason that they can sell these bikes at such great prices is because they ship them right to your house. So. Yeah, it's nice. And I'd say, you know, most of the big brands have a, a decent head badge. So why, why change it up just because it's a, you know, a value bike. I like the fact that it has that. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and start in on adjusting the front brake. I have a very worn out mat that I put down underneath to help me see my, the distance, uh, between the brake rotor and my caliper here. This is a hard one to get on camera, I feel like, but um, definitely easier with a white background to adjust it. Um, and I think we've said this before on other assembly videos, but you know, a lot of people will just say, go ahead and loosen your caliper bolts and then squeeze your brake a few times and hold it down and then tighten it uh, to adjust your disc brake. And I just gotta say that doesn't really work out all that hot. Um, I really do like to loosen up the caliper bolts and center it by eyeball, which is not all that easy, but um, you know, you're gonna get a, a better centering on the on your brake caliper. 
I've got it loosened enough to where I can move it. Maybe a little bit more. You don't want to loosen it a crazy amount because then it's going to move on you pretty, pretty easy. And I feel like this is the part where, you know, a lot of experience really pays off because the screws are just loose enough that Matt can kind of force the uh, um, the caliper around the disc rotor. And so it's just those micro adjustments that really make the big difference of hearing squeak and not hearing any. And I mean, you can get away with, you know, a little bit of rub, but I mean, it's going to be, it's a brand new bike. You want it to, to be noiseless. And so there's the example of like, that's rubbing. And what we're going to try to do is get the bottom part of the caliper further over to where that's not, not going to be rubbing there. And since we're doing the brakes now, I will just say, uh, at the 1595 price point, uh, hydraulic brakes are definitely not a given. And so that's going to be definitely one of the highlights. Uh, or really, if you're comparing this to a lot other electric bikes, you might find that this model or the Ride One Up models in general, um, you know, the 700 series, this bike have hydraulic brakes, whereas perhaps other bikes you're looking at have mechanical. I would say pretty much any hydraulic disc brake is going to going to be quite a bit better than most mechanicals. Uh, they do make a few really nice mechanical disc brakes out there, but the hydros really do give you quite a bit of stopping power and a nice lever feel as well. I think this might be one that, uh, like before where, um, I start to tighten it down and it's hard to, hard to see, but the brake caliper starts chasing on me when I tighten it down, which means that it, one, it's going to be hard to get it to tighten down without it moving. And then the other thing is, is that it probably needs this mount faced. So a little bit of material taken off. Um, and that's one of those things that requires a professional tool to kind of clean off the mount. And this is one of those things that is getting to be a little bit more common uh, from bikes out of the boxes. Uh, so when you tighten it down, it's shifting because this surface isn't completely level with itself. So we're going to have to go ahead and probably take these off and see what we can do. So Matt is going ahead and taking a file here just to try to even that out maybe just slightly definitely not something that i recommend for your average person as far as that goes um but i'm mainly just getting the, like the painted surface off of there and trying to level it out if you take a flat file and try to get it as level as possible then we can so the issue is is when we're tightening it down it doesn't have enough bite and so then it's kind of moving sideways as I tighten the brake caliper down. So after filing that down a little bit, I'm just gonna see if we can really get this front caliper dialed in. There we go. And as usual, <laughs> uh, Matt continues to impress with getting the disc brakes absolutely perfect. No rub there, he just stand it up using that file a little bit and just allowed him to adjust them ever so slightly so they're perfect. And that'll, the calipers are probably breaking in a little bit as far as that goes. So we might just get, yeah, see once the calipers reset, then that rub goes away. Press the brake a little bit and it might happen, but that'll break in where I don't think there'll be any issue with that. So the front brake took a little while, but you know what? That's kind of the nature of the beast sometimes with these disc brakes. All right, we're gonna get these pedals on. Got my big old pedal wrench here. Just gonna go ahead and hit it with the grease gun a little bit on the side of the threads. That's one of those important spots that you really do want to make sure you're getting some grease in. These are the Welgo metal pedals come on so many electric bikes. Yeah, it looks like that one's got the... 
Yep, W R on here and W L. So this will be the right hand pedal. And this one is going to be normal thread, and the left one is going to be reverse thread. Easiest way I always say is just uh, it would be you're threading the pedal on the way that you'd be pedaling the bike, so it has to go forward. So the other side is going to go reverse thread, which makes it to where it would be pedaling forward. And with my bike stand, it makes it super nice to where I can just might be able to do this if you're doing the upside down bike mechanic move too. If you're doing it without a stand, just pedal it backwards and snug it down. All right, let's see if we can get this dialed in. Take this and adjust the cable tension out a little bit, which make it come up through the range a little bit quicker. The only the other thing too that I'm seeing here is the barrel adjuster is getting pretty close to its limit. So if we unthreaded this more to take it through the range to bring it up a little bit more, we'd be close to unthreading it all the way. So I gotta go ahead and screw this all the way back in all the way back in and then I'll do like probably about a turn out. That way I've got room to move it in and out to adjust my cable tension. And then I'm gonna see if I can um, pull some of this excess housing through. I don't know what's going on through the frame or if it's tightened down to where it might be pretty difficult, but I do feel like that's something that we need to check out. Now you're pulling that tension, the cable towards you. Yep, pulling that. So I loosened it, pulled it, and now we ought to have a little bit more room with our barrel adjuster because we screwed it back in. And we did go ahead and tug on this cable just to try to get a little bit more slack in there to uh, potentially alleviate any shifting issues and adjustment issues. Goes through the gears now. Still got a little bit of brake rub, which doesn't make me thrilled, but. I think what might actually be some of our problem, the limit screw might be too tight to where it's not coming up. Um, that's not the one, this is the one for it. Now is that the low limit screw or the high limit screw for those? And this one here, it should have it right on here. That's going to be the low limit screw with the L. And so low and lower gears. So, yep, high is going to be down here for coming off this way. So I adjusted that. And if we had it too far, let's let's go ahead and show the extremes here. So if I go it too far with it, then the chain could actually move off that way into the bike which is what we don't want to happen so this is going to limit how far this piece moves um, and your cable tension actually tells it how far it can move within these parameters so they're two separate things um, but your limit screws you can adjust even if you have no cable tension on at all so you do want to make sure that your limits are adjusted to where it's not creeping off the, the back here when I press in on it. And that's kind of one of those things that it's hard to explain on a video, but um, hitting it with my thumb here and pushing in on it on this pivot point, that's just hard to know unless you have some experience with these or some hands-on experience. But um, you could get some fingers pinched or things like that. So that's one that, you know, is definitely not that easy starting out and I would recommend a professional doing that um, so now I'm just gonna try to get my cable tension dialed in I hit a click there and it didn't move at all so I went ahead and screwed the cable tension down trying to bring it down through the range Let's see if we can get it going through
Hmm. Something don't feel right. Or the derailleur hanger could be bent. All right, here goes. Take the derailleur off. I'm gonna check it for derailleur hanger alignment. Use my DAG tool from Park. The DAG 2.2. Come in here and thread it right where the derailleur would normally be. Come down here. And we're going to check it up here and see. Holy moly. It's actually bent out. Delicate derailleur hanger. I don't like that. <laughs> Come in there. It's pretty close there. Yeah, so what we're trying to do here is get it aligned up in three spots with the rim. So this little piece here that I'm screwed into is the derailleur hanger. And that was tweaked just a little bit. And when that's tweaked one way or another, it means every one of your gears could be off. Now we were only having problems through just a couple up here, which, you know, it's it's not fun to have any sort of shifting issues. So another one of those things, in this case, not very easy to do unless you have some professional experience and the right tools to do it. And just generally with any electric bike you purchase, it's always good to, sometimes you can really see that the derailleur hanger is bent. I actually took a look at it earlier and I personally didn't notice, but clearly uh, needed some adjustments. So, and that's something that just happens with any bike that gets shipped in a box, even to a bike store, so. Yeah, that's very true. And it's tricky because, you know, when you're splitting the difference between up here and down here, you're only talking about, you know, two, three millimeters. Maybe it's a little bit more than that, but, um, you know, you go two, three millimeters, and by the time you get over here, you can amplify that. So let's see how we're doing now. A little hesitant there. Oh wow, it shifts entirely different if you do it on the if you do it on the outside of the paddle a little bit more compared to like on the inside. It shifts a lot better. I've got a lot of experience with these, but I have noticed that sometimes they're a little bit more finicky, and you can get them to shift just the way you want by hitting them a little bit differently. We do have a Shimano Acera rear derailleur here, a little step up from some of the super entry level Shimano Tourney, uh, Altus, and then maybe Acera's next. So that's always nice to see as well. Yeah. Trigger shifters up there. Oof, that's gonna be a tricky one, I think. Boy, these are gonna be real hard to adjust in here, I feel Just like. Tight. What's Just space? It? Yeah, yeah, tight space. Not a whole lot of room to get the Allen wrench in. Probably easier to see from this angle, but Matt was just kind of pointing out that where that's mounted, it's just a little bit tricky to get some Allen wrenches in there. Not impossible, but just the uh, unique geometry of this frame. Yeah, you're just gonna have to sneak in there and tighten slowly and, and move it around quite a bit. I almost feel like one of my little mini ratchet wrenches would fit in there. Yeah. A little bit better. I still gotta get one of those. Yeah, those are nice. So Matt's got out his uh, rotor bending tool. Definitely something that you maybe don't wanna mess with as a first time uh, DIY bike mechanic, but just slight adjustments. Yeah, that's definitely one you can mess up real quick. It's little movements to bend the rotor. 
And I'm going on a certain part of the rotor that these little uh, pieces here just require just a tiny little bit of tweaking. All right, so just took the bike out of the stand and now I'm gonna adjust my controls up here a little bit. I was kind of guesstimating it while it was in the stand and um, still need to align this a little bit, maybe with the front wheel. Actually, huh, looks like they actually had it pretty dialed out of the box. I thought it was a little bit off, but that's not too bad. And this would be the point where you can adjust the handlebars for where you want to be. I feel like this is a little low, so I'm gonna probably bring them up yeah. a little bit. Four mil just to loosen these up. And we'll see kind of where we get these handlebars where they're tilted up. But something you could also consider, perhaps if you're an even taller rider, you could also put an adjustable stem on there and that's going to give you even more adjustability, but we'll kind of see how this feels. That looks a little bit, a little bit better there, huh? There we go. This is going to be a plush ride with the big tires and the suspension fork. You can see how that is from the side. It's going to be a nice upright riding position. Again, these flared back bars on here, um, really fun to ride, you know, like when you're on the bike. It's, uh, I don't know. There's one of my favorite handlebars, and I don't have a bike with these, to be quite honest, so... As always, Matt getting bike envy on, on this channel. Like, ah, oh, this will be the next one. This will be the next one. I say that all the time. <laughs> one of the things that I wanted to show off with this electric bike before we get the passenger package on here is putting the Thule Yup Maxi child seat. This is something that other companies have done as well but they have a window here, and that means that it is compatible with the seat. And that's always really nice because you can just buy the seat, tighten it down, and you can attach the safety strap. The seat is really high quality. You can see it shows somewhere. We've been using it for now a couple of years with our son, he loves it. And so what's great about the Cafe Cruiser, got room for your kid on the back with the Thule Up Maxi. I'll go ahead and put a link in the description to this child seat. And now you know that this child seat works right off the shelf. No adapter plate needed, really like that. And it's a high quality product from Thule. They're very well known in the bike industry. All right, so next we're gonna go ahead and throw on the rear passenger package in case you have a little bit of an older child or perhaps a petite uh, adult for the rear of this cafe cruiser. So now we have the passenger package installed. So it comes with these skirt guards here that are clear. And it comes with these pegs here that fold up and down, which is really nice. Feel pretty solid on there. And then what I think is really cool that Ride One Up did with their seat is actually they're just leveraging the same window that I just showed you with the Thule Up Maxi. So all you need to do to take off and put on this seat is simply kind of reach your hand underneath here and just like that, it kind of clicks into place. I'll take it out just once more, but uh, that's really slick way of getting the seat on and off. So sometimes you have a passenger, sometimes you want to use cargo. So, and another thing just worth highlighting is this rear rack has a 130 pound capacity, which, which is actually quite a bit. So you can put a decent sized rider back here, uh, tons of cargo. So, and it, of course it's welded right to the frame. So really like the rear rack, really like the passenger pack, definitely worth picking this up because it's just so much easier to use. Of course you could use a DIY seat, but it's not going to be as slick as this. I can pretty much guarantee it. All right, that wraps up the assembly of the Ride One Up Cafe Cruiser. Again, if you're looking to purchase a Ride One Up electric bike, please do me a favor and use the link in the description before you make your purchase. 
It's a free and easy way to help support the channel. Also give the video a like and consider subscribing if you're new here. As always, thanks to Matt from All About Bikes for assembling the Ride One Up Cafe Cruiser. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.